studying the book of St. Paul to the Galatians, and uh, this is supposed to be our fourth class tonight. We will take a break from going verse by verse until the next session, which is going to be on the 9th of December. That'll be our last class for this year. So with that class, we would have completed uh, five classes, and then I have one in New York this coming weekend and one in, in Greek on Sunday. So the beginning of our salvation starts with Evangelismo. Every Sunday in Easter, we chant, Today is the beginning of our salvation. Why? Because the Son of God became the Son of the Virgin. This is the mystery that was silenced before all ages, according to St. Paul, and uh, our salvation begins with the good news to the Virgin Mary that the Son of God will incarnate. He will become man. So that's the beginning of our salvation. During Christ's circumcision, which most of us miss because it happens to be on the 1st January. I think during that time, because of the New Year's dance and because of other things, uh, we usually have 40, 50 people in the church, Father, if that. But this is what we chant. You accepted circumcision to bring an end to the shadow, to the antitypes of the Old Testament, and to remove the passions of our soul, the passions of the, the fallen nature, the passions that cover us. During his baptism, we had the theophany, the appearance, the manifestation of the Holy Trinity. The last name of God was revealed by Christ. In the Old Testament, Moses was revealed that the name of God is Lord or Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh means Lord. But the last revelation of the name of God in the New Testament is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Apolitikion of Holy Thursday night. You ransomed us from the curse of the law by your precious blood. That's exactly what we chant on Holy Thursday night towards the end of the 12 Gospels. You ransomed us. You freed us. You redeemed us from the curse of the law by your precious blood. He became the curse because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And he freed us from that curse. So we are saved by the cross of Christ. Actually, in the liturgy somewhere, one of the prayers towards the end of the liturgy speaks about the workings of our salvation. So we are saved by the cross of Christ, by faith in Christ, and by the mysteries, baptism, Holy Communion, Chrismation, all the mysteries. So we have cross, faith, grace, purification. We have to purify our hearts so we can continue to have the grace of God because God does not like to live in anything impure. What separates us from God and from the grace of God, what de-energizes the grace of God is sin. So by continuing to follow the commandments, we purify our heart and then we have the light of God in our hearts continually. So we are not saved by works of the law, St. Paul says. The law was simply a tutor. It was a helping aid to show us how sinful we are. That's what the law did. It pointed out all the different sins that we can begin to restrain ourselves and become ready to accept Christ. The Judaizing Christians that were going after St. Paul, because they were national Jews, and they said, okay, this is wonderful, we accept Christ, but what happened to the law? We're not going to give up all these traditions that we have been practicing for so many years. So they also thought that it wasn't enough to follow Christ, but they also needed to do some of the things that they were doing with the law of Moses like circumcision. So they would tell the new Christians, the new converts, Gentiles, that were taught by St. Paul, yeah, St. Paul is not really one of the twelve, because he wasn't around when Christ was teaching. He's a lesser apostle. And they were trying to undermine 
the work of St. Paul. This is why in the chapter 3 of Galatians, St. Paul says, You foolish Galatians, you've received all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You've received all grace without the law. Why now are you being confused and you think you have to go back and start following the law all over again? The church started out of Israel. These Judaizing Christians were the first people who converted to Christianity. The people of God in the Old Testament were not not only the Jews, but also Gentiles who accepted the God of the Jews, as we're going to see in the scriptures. So the church is the continuation of God's new covenant of true Israel. The topic tonight is, what is the relationship between the church of God and Israel? The church did not replace Israel. It did not push Israel aside. The church was conceived in Jerusalem. The church is the continuation of God's new covenant of true Israel, and true Israel includes Jews and Gentiles who believed in Christ. The church's birthday took place in Jerusalem at Pentecost, where 5,000 Jews believed after Peter taught right there in Jerusalem. So what is this? These are the promises, all the promises of God in the Old Testament are finding their fulfillment in the remnant, the true believing people of Israel, those who were expecting the Messiah. Remember Elijah at some point around 800 years before Christ during the uh, reign of Ahab. There was so much idolatry in Israel where he lost hope. Elijah says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. Jezebel was the evil queen of the north kingdom of Israel and uh, she persecuted the prophets of Israel and she brought all kinds of idols in the north kingdom and the south kingdom of Israel. And Elijah is despondent, says, Lord, they killed your prophets. Where are your believers? I am the only one left. He was a prophet, but he didn't know everything. And God tells him what? Dean. No, Elijah, you're not the only one. I have 7,000 men who did not bow down to Baal. This was the remnant. So we have a remnant of true believers in the Old Testament. And this remnant continued all through history and it found itself even during the difficult times of the Sadducees and the Pharisees because these two groups began to believe in the Talmud more so than the Torah, more so than the written scriptures of the Old Testament. They created their own beliefs and that's why Christ castigated the Pharisees on Holy Tuesday night. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees! because they were mistranslating and abusing the law of Moses. So this remnant, these Jews with good disposition, and when Peter taught, sure, they were deceived by the Pharisees and the scribes, and uh, they crucified Christ. But then after that, they repented. During Holy Pentecost, 3,000 believed on the first day, and another couple thousand on the second day. So we have 5,000 Jews who believed after Peter's preaching in Jerusalem. So the church is basically the continuation of true Israel, believing Israel. St. Paul explains this in Romans with the image of an olive tree. We're supposed to craft a wild olive tree on a good, no, actually the other way around. On the contrary, if we have a wild olive tree, we craft a good branch of a good olive tree and then we just cut off the tree at a place so the good branch can begin to develop. Well, the opposite happened here in Romans. The good olive tree were the faithful Jewish remnant and the Gentiles were the wild olive tree that was grafted on the good olive tree, which was the 12 apostles, the 70 apostles, relatives uh, of uh, Christ, James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. All these people were that good olive tree that was passed down from the promises of Abraham. So all the promises of God in the Old Testament were perfected and fulfilled 
filled with Christ and all those who were grafted on his body, the church. So the church is not for the Greeks, is not for the Jews, is it's for everyone. The church is ecumenical. Now the promised land, the tabernacle, the ark of the covenant, the temple, all these were shadows. We call them antitypes, a prefigurement until the prototype comes. The prototype. So the promised land was a prefigurement of the upper Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Oh, the Ark of the Covenant was a prefigurement of the Panagia, of the Theotokos. She is the real Ark. And the temple was the antitype of Christ's body. Remember when Christ says, I will tear down this temple, pointing to the temple of Solomon. I will tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And, and the Jews said what? It took us 46 years to build this third temple of Solomon. A couple of the other temples were destroyed. And you will rebuild this in three days? Well, what did he mean? He meant that the temple now would be transferred to his body because the temple was necessary for sacrifices. And after the perfect sacrifice came, there is no more need for the temple. So the temple stayed around for another another 37 years to give the Jews enough time to transfer over from the law because this couldn't have happened overnight because some of these people were used to the some of the activities of the law and the things that they were doing. So the apostles were still going to the temple to slowly convince a lot of the Jews to come to the temple called Christ. But after 70 AD, the temple was near it no more. So it was destroyed totally as Christ prophesied and the whole Jerusalem was made into a field. So no Jew today is able to follow the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law needed a lamb being sacrificed every morning and every night at the temple. No more sacrifices in Jerusalem. After 70 AD, all the tribes and the archives are gone. We have no idea who belongs to what tribe out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Everything that the prophets taught, it was fulfilled in Christ. At Luke 18, after the conversion of Zacchaeus, Christ is telling his apostles, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will surrender himself to sinners, and he will be spot upon, he'll be flogged, die on the cross, and resurrect on the third day. And the writings of the prophets and of the law will be fulfilled in the Son of Man. So there's no more need for a temple because we have the pure offering, Christ. And yet, Christians today are sending money to the Jews for the last 50 years to rebuild the temple so that Jews can have sacrifices all over again. It's a blasphemy against the gospel of Christ to try to, to rebuild the temple so we can have more sacrifices. When Christ came and finished all that, what did, what did he say on the cross? Teteleste, it is finished. It didn't mean my life is over. That's not what he meant. Teteleste means... It is all complete now. All the writings of the prophets, everything of the Old Testament is finished. And then new covenant begins. If St. Paul was on earth today, he would be writing and pulling his hair out, not for the foolish Galatians, but for the foolish Christian Zionists who are acting worse than the Judaizing Christians <coughs> of all. Now, Christian Zionism is not very well known in Greece. We don't hear about it. A lot of the theologians there don't speak about it. But we need to know about it here in America because a lot of your co-workers are very confused. They're very good people. They want to follow the Bible, but they follow these mega churches who are hurting the Jewish people tremendously. There's nothing more anti-Semitic than this Christian Zionism that supposedly has been helping build and uh, strengthen the state of Israel for the last 60, 70 years. So I'm not going to go through the invention of Christian Zionism. I'm just going to mention a couple of names. So the invention of Christian Zionism and the rapture started with John Nelson Darby, who was an Anglican person, and he left the Church of England, and he started his own denomination. After espousing the rapture idea from this Margaret MacDonald, some prophetess, 
And uh, it's my personal opinion, but she's like the prophetess of Philippi. Mm. That young girl in Philippi, that's she saw a vision that Christ is going to come back. Instead of two comings, he's going to make a third coming, another coming before the Antichrist to rapture, to take up all the born-again Christians so they will not have to face the wrath of the Antichrist. It's a very good story for all the wimpy Christians who don't want to suffer. <laughs> It's a wonderful idea. And unfortunately at the time, Theodor Herzl was the political Zionist and he was trying to look for a place for the Jews to have a country. And Theodor Herzl was a political activist and he says, listen, give me a country in Africa. I'll go anywhere. But the evangelical Christians of England, after being heavily influenced by John Nelson Darby and 10 of them were on the cabinet of the government of England, said, no, 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 we have to give you Jerusalem. We have to give you Palestine because once Israel becomes a nation, then Christ will come back again to rapture the church. Until that happens, then Christ is not going to come back. And that's about the beginning of Christian Zionism, which was highly distributed by Schofield. Schofield, who was a questionable individual, spent some time in jail. He was a district attorney. He embezzled money. And later on, he followed some of the work of John Nelson Darby. He put together the Schofield Bible around middle of the 19th century. And during that time, the Civil War was taking place in America, and thousands, if not millions, of Bibles were distributed, and they were all with footnotes about end times. Christ is coming back soon, and this is going to happen. He'll come back once Israel becomes a nation, and once they have all their promised land, Christ will come back again. Unfortunately, the evangelicals in America accepted this ideology, and today about 40 million evangelicals believe this way. They interpret the Bible on some prophecies that have no theological basis at all. Prophecies that the church had no idea about the first 18 centuries. So tonight, we're going to dispel seven of the myths of Zionist Christianity. Some of these assumptions that do not exist in the Bible, but people believe them. The first one is, God blesses those who bless ethnic Israel. Number two, ethnic Jews are God's chosen people, even today. Number three, the promised land belongs to Israel. Ben-Gurion said, I don't believe in God, but I believe he gave us the land. <laughs> <laughs> That's his classic statement. I don't believe in God, but I do believe he gave us the land. Number four, the church will be raptured into heaven before the reign of the Antichrist. Number five, Christ will reign 1,000 years on earth with the converted Jews and the good people who are not born-again Christians. The born-again Christians will be taken up. Number six, God has two plans, one for the church and a separate one for Israel. So we're not to convert Jews. John Hague says, leave them alone. They're still God's chosen people. And this is why Christian Zionists are not philo-Semitic, but highly anti-Semitic. They condemn the Jews to perdition by teaching this way, by telling them, you don't have to do anything. God will save you. God has a plan for you. You don't have to become Christians. But this goes totally against the scriptures and against what the apostles taught. So very quickly, we'll go through these seven myths and we'll try to show that this is not so. This is diametrically opposed to the Word of God. So God blesses those who bless Israel because in Genesis 12, 3, God told Abraham before we had a state of Israel, before we had a people of Israel. He only spoke to Abraham and he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So now the Zionists take that to always mean that God will always be against those who go against Israel, regardless of what Israel does. In Genesis 22, 17, we'll see that God does not only bless Israel. He tells Abraham, in the Abrahamic covenant, I will bless you and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand on the seashore. How do the Zionists interpret this? The stars means the church that will be raptured, and the sand means the Israel that will stay behind to be with Christ for a thousand years. This is 
quite Procrustean. Have you ever heard of the Procrustean bed? No? It's, it's Greek mythology. This thug, he had a home, and uh, when people would walk in, people who visited, he would have them lay on his bed. And if their legs were too long, then he would cut off the uh, part that extended beyond the bed. If the legs were too short, then he would pull them, stretch them, it's exactly what we do to the Word of God. So I will bless you and I will multiply you, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You, Abraham, not Israel. There's no Israel yet. So this is a specific blessing to, to Abraham who tells him, in your seed, which will show that his seed is going to be Christ, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed and not just Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And St. Paul explains, he does not say, and to seeds, meaning many, but as of one, to your seed, who is Christ. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So ethnic Jews are not God's only chosen people, even in the Old Testament. God was very inclusive. When the Jews left from Egypt, a lot of Egyptians converted to Judaism and followed them. And in Isaiah 56, verse 6, 7, listen to this. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord, who believed in the Lord of Israel, and they want to serve him and love the name of the Lord. Everyone who keeps my commandments, even them, even the Gentiles who became Jews in the Old Testament, I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this is in the Old Testament. So God shows no favoritism. Rahab was a prostitute, but she became one of God's people. She's a progenitor of Christ. The same thing with Ruth, that wonderful story of Ruth, who was a Moabite. And she followed her mother-in-law all the way to Israel. She became an Israelite, and she became one of the grandmothers of David. David the king. I think she's the great grandmother of King David. Malachi 1.11. I love this prophecy. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the nations. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name. Which church today, Dean, uses a lot of incense? The Orthodox Church, right? And a pure offering in every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. Holy Eucharist, our divine liturgy, is being prophesied hundreds of years before Christ. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Remember Queen Esther. She was very beautiful and one of the kings married her and listened to this and tried to uh, destroy the Jewish people. And Esther intervened to the king and she saved her people. That's why Esther is a, is a type of the Panagia. Listen to this. And in every province, city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday after Esther saved their life. Then many people of other nationalities became Jews because of the fear of the Jews fell upon them. When they realized the power of their God, they became Jews. And God says, these people are welcome in my house. Matthew 8, verse 10 to 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed about the centurion came to Jesus and said, Lord, you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word. You don't have to come. Say the word and my servant will become well. And Jesus says, I say to you that such faith, such great faith I have not seen in the entire Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, the unbelieving Jews, those who crucified Christ and did not repent, they will be cast out into outer darkness. Then in Colossians 
3 12. Paul says, For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. So now, the elect of God in the New Testament, the elect of God are not the Jews. On the contrary, the unbelieving Jews are prone to go to the outer darkness. But the elect of the New Testament, the chosen people of the New Testament, are the believing Jews and Gentiles. Anyone who believes in Christ. And in Peter 2.9, Peter uses this verse from the Old Testament, the same verse from Isaiah, to tell them, that this applies now to the new people of God who are the Christians. In Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. In Philipp Philippians 3.3, 3, St. Paul goes all out and he says, We are the new circumcision because we have gone through a spiritual circumcision. We are fighting our passions. We have a circumcised heart. We are not children of wrath. When we pray every day, when we try to follow the commandments, when we try to imitate Christ on a daily basis, when we go through the mysteries of the church, then we are practicing a spiritual circumcision. And St. Paul says in Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision because we have the Spirit of God and we glory in Jesus Christ and we put no longer any confidence in the flesh. In other words, physical circumcision of the Jews is totally meaningless after the crucifixion of Christ. The third myth is that the promised land belongs to Israel. You, you heard that. Yeah, God gave it to them. It belongs to them. Who does the long belong to? Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, says the Lord. The land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. So, the land is not given unconditionally to anyone. In Ezekiel 33, 25, 28, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God to Israel, The land will be given to them, and they would stay in it as long as as they followed the commandments of God, as long as they were as obedient as Abraham. Thus says the Lord, you eat meat with blood, you lift up your eyes toward your idols, and you shed blood. Should you then possess the land? For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass so nowhere in the scriptures is God promising land to unbelieving Israel. Ezekiel 47 verse 21. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves, among the 12 tribes, according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves, and listen to this, and for the strangers, for your neighbors, for the Palestinians that have been living there for the last 10 centuries. They were there after the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 AD. So you will share the land. This is an inheritance for you and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So all those who were not Israelites, who were Edomites, and they became Jews, who were Moabites, like Ruth, and they became Jews, they were given part of the land. So the land was never just for the Jews, but for all people of God. And Joshua gives a warning to the Jewish people, Joshua, who had all those wars, to clean out that land. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed down to them. Did that happen? Yes. The northern, again, with Jezebel during the time of Prophet Elijah. So many idols in the northern and the southern kingdom. They all bowed down to Baal, an idol. So if you bow down to idols, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. So the land was conditional. It was leased to the Israelites as long as they were obedient to God's 
covenant. And in Deuteronomy, when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in a land and act corruptly and make carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord like they did when Moses was coming down from uh, from the Mount Sinai and they carved a calf, a golden calf. The Lord says, when you do that, you will provoke the Lord to anger. I call heaven and earth as a witness and you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. Did that happen? They transgressed. The greatest transgression was they did not accept their Messiah and they crucified him. Okay, number four. The church will be secretly raptured into heaven before the reign of the Antichrist. Totally anti-scriptural. It will not happen. This is a novel teaching that came about in the uh, somewhere in the uh, 19th century. We see nothing like that in the scriptures. So basically what the uh, Christian Zionists are teaching, or the dispensationalists, that's another term for them, they teach that those who are born again, they will be beamed up by Christ. Christ will come back, pull them up. And then the rest of the people, the unbelievers, will have to deal with the Antichrist. The Jews will deal with the Antichrist. Seven years later, Christ mm -hmm. will come back again to start his millennial kingdom. So we have a couple tiers of salvation here. We have a couple judgments, but that's not what Matthew says in, in verse 13, where we have uh, the parable of the weeds, of the tares. A good farmer planted seed, and then an evil person went behind him, and he planted evil, bad seed. And weeds came up. The question was, what should we do? Should we go and uproot the weeds? The owner of this lot, who happens to be God, says, no, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, and then gather the wheat in my barn. <laughs> Well, Schofield has to reverse this. He says, no, Christ is wrong. He, he, he first is going to pull up the wheat, the good people, and then he'll, he'll burn the tares. In his footnotes, he actually reverses the teaching of Christ in his parable. So from this, we see that there'll be one judgment at the end. Christ has two presences. He came 2,000 years ago to teach us and to die for our sins. And then he will come back again in glory to judge the living and the dead all at once. And we see the same an anti-rapture verse in Acts 3, 20, 21. Christ went into heaven after his ascension, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. So Christ will stay in heaven until the restoration and the renewal of the universe, the renewal of the heaven and the earth, which will happen at the very end time, at the last day of history. Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torments ascends forever and ever those who were Worship the Antichrist. Not a good idea because if we think, well, you know what, I have children, I need to buy food, I need to, listen, if we take the mark, life will be over in three and a half years anyway. So we're not going to gain anything. In three and a half years, after the Antichrist tries to mark everyone, Christ will return. And in Revelation, St. John writes, those who took the mark of the beast, they'll have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And then we have this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. But why are they here? The saints are supposed to be in heaven. Hmm. How can they be here if they're in heaven? They don't know what to do with this one. <laughs> the church is raptured. No saints are left on the earth. They're all gone. They're in heaven. And only the Jews and the unbelievers and the rest of the humanity will stay to fight with the Antichrist and receive his mark. But here we see that there will be saints, and saints means Christians. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those are the ones who are going to fight the Antichrist and strengthen the church during those years. That's when Elijah and Enoch will come back. And Elijah will teach or try to convert the Jews. And Enoch will speak to the rest of the nations who need to believe. Myth number five, Christ will reign a thousand years on the earth after the destruction of the Antichrist. But according to St. Peter, there'll be no earth left. St. Peter says that the entire earth will melt in its heat. The whole universe will become like a coat inside out. It'll become renewed. Father Athanasius Mithilneo says that the nuclear energy kept inside the elements will be unleashed and the whole universe will become brand new it will become renewed and will change into the kingdom of God. So there's no earth because the revelation says that earth and sky went away in his presence. They are gone. We're going into a different dimension, into the kingdom of God, to the upper Jerusalem, which is a total new reality. The kingdom of God. Again, about the the millennial kingdom of Christ on earth. And, and the Jehovah's Witnesses believe this. Many, many Protestants believe this. Not all of them. Christ is going to reign on earth for a thousand years. But he himself told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And the Jehovah's Witnesses think that they're going to be eating and drinking and rejoicing and having all kinds of uh, gatherings with food and drink. And in Romans 14, 17, St. Paul reminds them, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. We will become renewed. Our body, after the resurrection, our body will become spiritualized and we will not need to eat and drink anymore. We will not need oxygen machines. They'll all be gone. Our body will be just like the body of Christ after his resurrection that was able to go through doors and walls. Number six, God has two plans, one for the church and a separate one for Israel. Doesn't agree with Peter during Pentecost. Then Peter teaching the Jews in Jerusalem. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. In Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. There is no other way for sins to be forgiven other than the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 3.22, 23, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Who's that? Christ. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Number seven, the Christian Zionists have been supplying Israel with military power for the last 60, 70 years in the tune of 200 million dollars per year. They put pressure because of the 40 million evangelicals that believe this ideology, this extremely anti-Semitic ideology. They are suggesting to our politicians that unless they help Israel, they'll have the curse of God, and any nation that goes against Israel will be destroyed. So because of the voting power, two billion is sent to Israel every year. And I believe that without this amount of money, Israel would have been forced to make peace with its neighbors many years ago. So by helping militarily and financially the ethnic Jews of the land of Israel today and by telling them that they don't need Christ. They're not only anti-Semitic for their lives here on earth, but they're contradicting what Peter was doing in the Acts of the Apostles, as the ecumenists do today, who say that, oh, there's many ways to salvation. There's different paths to salvation. We hear that today, even from Orthodox hierarchs. So Christian Zionism is a heresy. It has done a lot of damage to Christianity. 80% of the Palestinians many, many years ago, they were all Christians. And the Muslims came and they converted a lot of them. But we have thousands 
Over 50,000 Orthodox Christian Palestinians in Palestine. We have 14 Palestinian churches in California. They left their families behind and came to California. 14 Orthodox parishes. And I taught in a few of them many years ago. Wonderful people. So we pray and hope that this information and a lot of this is really coming out because of the situation in Israel right now. There's hundreds of videos on YouTube and other areas and the world is waking up. And thank God for this because it'll put a stop to these atrocities and will perhaps help a lot of these people in Israel to live in peace. And again, we're not anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is a crime. It's reprehensible as any racism, but anti-Zionism is not the same thing. Only by teaching the truth and by revealing to them the scriptures, there's hope and a good chance that we're going to have peace in that region sometime in the future.